Professor, please tell us, you um, make the argument that the Tea Party and the Occupy movement actually have a lot in common. What do you mean by that? Uh, I know it's, it seems uh, paradoxical, but uh, I think both movements uh, are expressing in a different way a common anger to a common problem. And the way they interpret this is the Tea Party uh, sees the problem as uh, a too big and overreaching government. Uh, the uh, Occupy movement sees the problem as a too big and overreaching big business. And uh, they don't understand that they are fighting two faces of the same monster, of the same le Leviathan, which is the intermingling between big government and big business. And uh, each one sees a side of it. Uh, the problem is the merging between the two. And uh, that's what I, my me the message that I have in the book is, so that this is the real problem we should be aware uh, of, and this is the real monster we should fight. And until we don't understand uh, this common problem and the way to fight it, I think we can't have a solution. So your idea that uh, these things spring from a, a common place of a merger of, of big business and big government. This is influenced by your uh, personal experience growing, growing up in Italy, and that has influenced your critique of America. Tell us how that uh, affects your view. Yeah, uh, in, in many ways, but uh, let, let me start with one factoid. Um, there are a lot of uh, Italians who came to the United States uh, to study economics, and then some of them went back, some of them stay here. One characteristic uh, is that the vast majority, I'm not one of those, but the vast majority came here as extreme leftists. And when I say leftist, I'm not saying sort of uh, US leftists, sort of, uh, I'm just saying sort of uh, communist, uh, to the left of the Italian Communist Party. In the United States, you need a GPS to find where they are. This is sort of really sort of uh, far uh, to the extreme end of the distribution. And all of them, all of them, after this experience, became libertarians and free marketeers. Now, in part, as I say in the book, is uh, I think they saw the light. They study and they sort of... Uh, um, understood the, the power of competition and free markets. But I think there is a, a, more, a deeper message, which is in Italy, many people become leftists uh, because they have a sense of justice. And they see a corruption of the system and say the only way to fix the system is to overturn the system, to uh, impose new rules, and to maybe become a sort of a socialist system or whatever. And uh, once they see an alternative, they embrace this alternative. And that's my fear for the United States today. I think that uh, the United States um, had, historically, a very different form of capitalism. I think that for most of you who are, who are lucky enough to be born in this country, you don't really fully appreciate how different this is from the rest. Um, so that's the good news. The bad news is that I see that this system is degenerating into a system that looks very much like uh, the system I ran away from, the Italian corrupt system. And this degeneration brings with it a natural form of protest, of which I think the Occupy movement is just the, the beginning. Uh, and this protest might eventually lead to an attempt to kill the system or overturn in, in a major way, uh, destroying it. And so what pushed me to write this book is to try to say, look, that's not the only alternative. The, the, the real alternative is to sort of uh, eliminate the crony part to the world capitalist. It's not to kill capitalists, but to, to transform uh, the capitalist system into something that uh, most people like to, to live in, like uh, my sort of uh, Italian uh, friends who came here and they realized that uh, there is an alternative to uh, the extreme uh, left-wing protest and this is sort of a, a, a libertarian pro uh, protest. Um, but this is not something that uh, people naturally ca can, uh, come to, to realize. Tell us what you mean by crony capitalism and how does that differ from what 
we think capitalism is. So, and uh, I, I was raised Catholic, so I don't want to offend all the Catholics in the room, which I generally do, but uh, in, uh, we, it's not a coincidence that the word nepotism was invented in Italy, and in particular in Rome, and in particular in the Catholic Church. Why? Because, uh, and as you probably know, nepotism was like a, a misnomer, because uh, Nepotism stands for the popes that were trying to place their children, since officially they couldn't have children, they were called them nephews. Uh, but there is a reason that has nothing to do with the sort of faith. It's to do with the, the way the Catholic Church was organized, which was a monopoly. If you are in a position of monopoly, you can afford to appoint idiots in various positions and still have the system survive. Uh, in, in the United States, Protestant churches uh, are not better theologically, it's just that they live in a world of competition. If you appoint an idiot as a treasurer or as a minister of a church, the church loses people attended to and pretty soon disappears. And so, naturally, the Protestant churches here are more meritocratic and more efficient not because they are intrinsically theologically better. That's not my cup of tea. I don't want to enter you know, any theological discussion because I'm not qualified for it. But they are because they live in a competitive world. And the result is that, like, move two or three centuries later, people are much more religious in the United States than in Catholic Italy. Very few people actually Catholically still attend church. Why? It's because a inefficient organization eventually loses out and die. And so the, my, the point I'm trying to make is that there is an intrinsic relationship between having sort of market power and especially political power and being corrupt, being nepotistic, and eventually being inefficient and die. And Traditionally, the U.S. system was born into a very efficient, competitive system. And that is what kept the economy so efficient. And that was guaranteed social mobility. Uh, in a sense, the myth of uh, Horatio Alger's story that you uh, sort of raised from rag to riches uh, was not just a myth. I think it represented the opportunity that America offered to all of us. And this is what brought many people, including me, to this country, is because of the social mobility. And all these things are slowly disappearing. And uh, I'm not just saying that as a, you look at the statistics, they, they are sort of going down. And, and this is worrisome. And then the question is, why are they disappearing? Why sort of uh, the US uh, competitive free market system is degenerating into a crony capitalist system like the one of Italy or like the one, to be honest, prevailing in most of the rest of the world. So tell us a little bit about the evidence for this decline that you see. The, the evidence of this decline is that, uh, uh, you know, in, in much of the rest of the world, uh, democracy came after capitalism. And so democracy had to adapt to capitalism. The United States had the fortune that the capitalist, at least the way we know now with big corporations, et cetera, was born afterward. We first had a democratic country, and then sort of this big corporation uh, were, arose. And at some point, I think at the end of the uh, 19, beginning of the 20th century, there was like a big fight be, in order to sort of reestablish the balance of power between individuals and big corporations. Um, I think that, unfortunately, that power now is sort of uh, completely tilted in the opposite direction. Uh, there is a gigantic power of big corporations in Washington. They are dictating uh, the uh, business and economic agenda. And uh, this is not just a democratic or a republican thing. It's a bipartisan thing. Uh, it's sort of uh, it's the most bipartisan thing in a world uh, of Washington, Polarized, there is one thing that is sort of bipartisan, is how much the political system is bought off by uh, sort of business, and in particular the financial world. And that has been uh, 
devastating, not only for its economic consequences, but also for its political consequences. Because when people start not to recognize themselves in the system, uh, they start to abandon, they start to protest. And the thing I've seen in Italy, and I would like to avoid here, is this very vicious spiral between populist protest that brings demand for changing the rule of law, that brings sort of uh, the capitalists to be afraid to invest and ask them to for more subsidies. And these subsidies bring more populist revolt. And let me make a very concrete example. You probably remember that in March 2009, after the bailout of AIG, people were outraged of the fact that uh, uh, the manager of AIG walked away with, I think, 160 million in bonuses co collectively. And uh, the wage was so severe that Congress voted a 90% tax rate on bank bonuses. Um, now, clearly, 90% tax rate is expropriation by any sort of, uh, uh, you don't need to be sort of right wing or left wing to realize that sort of uh, this is really expropriation. Uh, but was justified, at least in the eyes, there was a vast majority in Congress that voted this, was justified the fact that people were outraged. Now, if you remember, this never became law because the Senate knew better than, than passing that. But I think the fact that Congress voted a large majority of this was pretty scary. Now, at the very time this was taking place, the other part of Washington, Geithner was creating this sort of a, um, uh, program that was called a public-private investment partnership, where a lot of our money, taxpayers' money, was put to subsidize the investment of few selected companies into toxic assets. And to my sort of estimates, uh, there were basically $2 of subsidy for every dollar they were putting down. And what was the main justification for this program? Was we are afraid, and we is sort of the financial world, the investors, etc. we are afraid that if we put this money down, uh, if we lose, it's our loss, but if we gain, we're going to expropriate 90% like uh, the, the manager in the um, AIG case. And so we do need some protection. We do, do need some privileges in order to induce us to invest. And you know, if you look at it from that perspective, it makes perfect sense. The problem is that those privileges, those advantages, created even more resentment that will lead to more populist outrage, that will lead to more sort of uh, ex post intervention and more insecurity in property rights that will lead sort of uh, the investors to demand even more protection. This is a vicious circle that is very difficult to break. And I've seen this play in Italy, and I've seen the consequences that this brought in the Italian economy. And so I think enough is enough. We need to stop early on because this circle it sort of creates uh, a situation that the only people who want to start businesses are people who have connection in Washington. Uh, one thing that really sort of killed me and induced me to write the book is that I am a professor of entrepreneurship, and in 2009, some young fellows approached me because they had a business idea. Now, the idea was kind of interesting, was how to bypass the traditional financial system, so I paid some attention to that. And then it occurred to me, sort of, why did they come to me? We're not my students. I'm not the only entrepreneurship professor in Chicago, not even the most famous one. So wh why did they come to me? And to my disappointment, they said, oh, we have seen that you are very active on the public square. So we hope that you become our advocate to get some of the top money for our business. And I said, gee, first of all, I've not been clear about my, what my positions are. But most importantly, if we are in a world in which young entrepreneurs have a lobbying plan before they have a business plan, <laughs> we are really in a deep dude. <laughs> so let me follow up on that issue. Hasn't the United States always had a lot of crony capitalism? This, uh, this is a country where um, monopolists have operated for a long time. Uh, with the help of the government? Is it really so different now? You are certainly right that uh, uh, this country was never perfect. Uh, I think that we all subscribe to that. 
uh, I think is the degree. Um, it is true that monopolies existed here, and it's also true that uh, uh, some of them were supported by the government, but it's also true that this country had the courage in uh, uh, 1909 to break down the biggest uh, sort of uh, industrial company of the time, the Rockefeller, uh, as it has the courage to break down AT&T in 1984. Uh, this, this country invented the idea of antitrust. Uh, I remind people, in this country, the first antitrust law was in 1890. In Italy, the first antitrust law was in 1990, so a century afterward. I think that that's no small feat. And uh, this country fought against the money trust at the beginning of the 20th century and won by, by, by and large. Uh, so, now, what has changed? Uh, I think a lot of things have changed. One is business has become much more effective at lobbying. Uh, the way I describe is um, most people think about lobbying as a reactive activity, uh, like fighting to, got the, to get the government off your back, which I'm all for it. I'm a libertarian, so the most the government is off your back, the better it is. I'm all for it. However, what most libertarians like me don't understand, and that's part of why I wrote this book, is that now lobbying has changed, and from being reactive has become proactive. It's not anymore get the government off my back, it's get the government in my pocket. And uh, this is so effective that there is no other activity that is more profitable. Uh, let, let me make an example, which uh, is sort of uh, thanks to a book wrote by one of these lobbyists, Abramov, after he went to jail, decided to sort of uh, uh, tell his story. So in 2000, I think four or five, Tyco, the company that went through sort of uh, the fraud at the beginning of the millennium, uh, they were targeted by a, a, con uh, actually a senator to, uh, because they wanted to pass a law to subject Tyco to the U.S. copper tax, because Tyco did a, a reverse merger with the Bermuda company to try to avoid sort of uh, uh, U.S. copper taxes. A proud tradition in this country. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I think that we're exploiting a loophole, and I think it's legitimate for a business to try to exploit the loophole. It's legitimate for the government to sort of fix those loopholes. Uh, that's the rule of the game. And, and so... Of all people, luckily, a Republican senator tried to do that. And uh, what happened is that Tyco was very worried because the liability would have been $4 billion. Okay, which, if you flip the side of that, it means that they were able to elude $4 billion of taxes with that trick. And so they said, this is an emergency. They call uh, uh, the album of team, and uh, they say, we want a, the A-level team sort of uh, guys to help me in this process. So for the modic price of 150,000 a month, they dis di dis uh, deploy the A-level team. They play the old-fashioned good cop, bad cop strategy. So uh, half of the people were actually using money to give to the fundraising campaign of the very senators that were trying to pass this law, to trying to sort of mollify them. And the bad cop was actually uh, targeted to create fake grassroots organizations. There is even a term for this, it's called astroturfing, in which they create these fake organizations that say that capitalism as we know will end tomorrow if we tax Tyco. And uh, this strategy paid off. Uh, with $4 million of uh, uh, cost, they save $4 billion in taxes. So I challenge you to find not only any legal activity, even illegal activity, that gives you a return of 1,000 to 1. Uh, I, I'm not an expert in drug dealing, but I suspect that even sort of a dealing in cocaine does not give you those returns. <laughs> so the, the interesting thing is that businesses themselves are sick and tired because the true entrepreneurs of this country don't like to spend money in this way. However, it's become kind of too tempting. It's like a drug that you cannot not use it. Uh, you know, we, we have seen that even champions like Lam Hamston in bicycling, they, they dope themselves because they couldn't win. And that's what business is about. 
Today, if you don't dope yourself, you can't compete. And that's the, tragic, uh, the tragedy of this country. And we need to fix before we uh, have all the business corrupt. Because I've seen this in Italy. And the problem is not only that we have this spiral, is that then there is a natural selection that the good guys don't want to get into business. Because if business is lobbying Washington, it's not fun. They do other things. And the only one who sort of uh, win and emerge are the best at lobbying, not the best at producing new cars or new sort of gadgets or new ideas. And that's sort of uh, the beginning of the decline. If Italy is in this situation today, it's because it has walked down this path. And I don't want America to go the same way. So I think uh, we risk here maybe moving from a discussion of economics to one of ethics. And, uh, but uh, isn't it the obligation of business to make money the best way it can? And perhaps some of that might be uh, spent on, uh, on lobbying. What, does business really have social obligations? No, I, I'm not a big fan of the idea of corporate social responsibility. First of all, because most of the time, this corporate social responsibility is just a cover up to sort of either because you have problems. And this is uh, Marseille Ferguson as the most uh, uh, brilliant campaign for the environment, etc., and then people die in their minds. So that's not sort of uh, the, the, what you want. But most importantly, is because I do believe, even if I'm not sort of a uh, uh, big fan of the uh, Citizen United uh, uh, se uh, sentence uh, opinion, uh, I do believe that corporations are people. And so, in a sense, they represent what uh, the, the values of all of us. So, um, I think that before we talk about a social responsibility, we have to talk about an individual responsibility. So I, I'm not willing to attribute to corporations what I'm not willing to attribute to individuals, which is not zero. Uh, I think that the, the mistake we often make is they said, oh, there is a corporate social responsibility, but then individuals can do whatever they want. Uh, I think that the, the first thing is start from individuals. And I think that one pr problem that we have is that we have taken the mandate of uh, what it is to, be, to do business in a too narrow way. Even if you take sort of Milton Friedman's statement, it's often remembered as the only social responsibility of business is to make profits. But the sentence continues and say, sort of following the rules of the game and in a good sort of a competitive way. I don't remember the exact sentence, but that's the meaning of what he's saying. So if you take sort of Milton Friedman's statement at its face value, it does say that you do not want business to engage in lobbying that leads to a distortion of competition. Milton Friedman will be absolutely in favor of any lobbying to reduce the intervention of the, of the government into, into sort of uh, the business operation, but will also be very much against intervention that leads to a distortion of competition. And how do we fix this problem? And it says, I don't think that uh, there is any silver bullet to, to do it. And uh, I dedicate half of my book in trying to have multiple approaches to try to do it. Uh, one, which is very simple, is to tax lobbying. After all, we, there is one thing we know as economists. If you want to reduce something, you tax it. Uh, we might disagree on how much and what is the optimal way, et cetera, but we know that that works. But I think that that's not the only way to do it. Because as I told you, if the return is 1,000 to 1, even if you tax it heavily, people will keep doing it. So there, there is a multiple approaches. And, and some is to basically reduce the money that the government allocates, because that reduces the return to investment for a lobbyist. But another one is to try to train people. And I take responsibility upon myself. I'm, I'm in a business school. To train people effectively in business school to say, the, the, the role of business is not just to make money, but to make money in a way that is not destroying sort of uh, not only the environment as sort of uh, the environment, also our business environment. Because if you make money at the cost of uh, the functioning of the capitalist system, that's not a good way to make money. And we might not be able to forbid it legally because regulation is not that effective, but we shouldn't forget there are social sanctions. And as a business community or as a business school, we should shun upon way to make money that are considered sort of uh, detrimental to the system overall. And we don't use that sort of uh, lever, and we should. Uh, and 
we don't even use the, the level of teaching students what we think is right or wrong. Um, most economists take the view we are scientists. And as a physicist does not tell in atoms what is right to do and what is wrong to do, simply describe what an atom does, uh, we should do the same. And I say we forgot that we are social scientists. So there is a difference. We don't, physicists don't teach atoms. We do teach our atoms that are business people. And as a result, the way we teach inevitably has a moral component, either sort of open or close it. Uh, there, there was a French philosopher that said, you cannot not choose because not choosing is choosing not to choose. And it's not just playing with words. It's a substantive point that when you describe something in a purely positive way, objective way, you are de facto giving a moral sort of a innuendo that you don't make it explicit. So when we teach students, for example, this is something that we do all the time, the, the model of crime and then the economic model of crime is that people uh, commit a crime when the expected benefits is bigger than the expected cost. Expected cost is the probability of being caught times the, the cost of the punishment. It's a very useful model. However, if we limit ourselves to say uh, people c commit a crime when the expected benefits is bigger than the expected cost, or even we say often it is rational to commit a crime when the expected benefits is bigger than the expected cost, the implicit statement is that it is irrational not to commit a crime when the expected benefits is bigger than the expected cost. And irrational is not a good word. And people don't like to be associated to be ir irrational. So we are de facto taking a position without saying it. And so I'm very much against a teaching of ethics in business school. Because first of all, we're no good at doing ethics. Second, if you want to sort of ignore a problem, you create a course for that separate problem. Uh, I think that in Italy, when I grew up, there was a separate course on religion. And that's the reason why nobody goes to church in Italy anymore. Uh, that, that's the result. I want to have, in the discussion of business practices, finance, marketing, strategy, say this is a good practice because it's good for the market overall. Not good. I, I have no position to say this is good with a capital G for a moral sense with a capital M. But I'm an economist, so I know what is detrimental to the, to the function of the market and what is not detrimental. And I think certain behaviors and certain strategies are detrimental to the market overall. And as a business professor, we should say that. One of the things you talk about in your book is the power of shame. Uh, it, it seems like it's almost a Victorian concept uh, these days. How can you use shame to change the functioning of our economy? As a sort of Chicago economist, I'm not enamored of regulation, as you can figure it out. I think that sometimes is necessary, but I fear that regulation is often capture. Um, what does it mean capture is that the regulated design the regulation that is best for them rather than best for the country at large. And, and the more complicated and the more technical the regulation is, the more this takes place. That's the reason why I resort, or I, I'm more faith in sort of uh, social norms and, and shaming. Uh, because the shaming is sort of a flip side of the social norms. And why do I think is, is, is important? Because social norms can only be enforced when they are widely supported by the population. Because if they're not widely supported, people would not sort of uh, feel the, the shame and would not walk. And as a result, they're intrinsically much more democratic than regulation. Because regulation is decided by a few delegates, and most of the time, as I said, is, is corrupt because it's in the interest of the regulated. But shaming is sort of uh, very democratic. And it's quite effective in preventing some form of behavior. Um, and again, this is part of what I learned uh, in, uh, in, in the United States. As an Italian, I've always learned to cut corners and cut cues. And, uh, 
here I learned that this is unacceptable. Why? Because there is a law? No, but uh, I think that the social enforcement is such that I don't even think about doing it as a result of the social enforcement I receive here. Um, again, I think that uh, uh, when I came to this country, I was the typical sort of uh, macho Italian that uh, you see in the, in the movies, because that's the way you are raised in Italy. And I changed my view uh, to the point that when I go to Italy, uh, uh, people are shocked. Uh, and, and why is that the case? Because I was socialized in, into a different environment in which sort of uh, making certain jokes is unacceptable. It's not, it's not funny, it's unacceptable. Uh, why? Because it's almost weird. You must be weird to have certain attitudes. And that helps change, for example, the role of women. Uh, in Italy, women are sort of uh, in the dark age. Uh, they not only are absent from boards and top level of CEOs, etc., but the image that is portrayed of them is demeaning. Um, I, I see that uh, in a board in Italy, and uh, I had a fight that sort of ended up uh, 14 to 1. That's generally the way I lose, is sort of, uh, <laughs> um, in which I was trying to sort of uh, 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 co-opt a new member that was a, a, a woman rather than, than, than a guy. And uh, I tried to make all the arguments about sort of why this not only was better in every, but anyway. Uh, so after the vote of 14 to 1, uh, one of the members actually asked for the CV uh, because he probably wanted to use it somewhere else. And the person that pass, passed him the CV said, oh, had you seen the picture, you would have voted for her. So this, and this is was sort of, nobody was even embarrassed that this was said. And I think that, uh, how do you change this? I don't think you can change with the law. Uh, I, I'm not so enamored of sort of regulation, et cetera. But I, at the same time, I do want to change it. And I think that social sanctioning is, 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 uh, has worked. And I think it's worked quite effectively in the United States in a lot of things. Uh, it takes time. It's not as immediate. Uh, my, my best example is, is, is smoking. So it's, uh, the, the idea that smoking is bad not only for yourself but for your neighbors is something that uh, basically got established 20 or 25 years ago. And to this day, uh, is sort of uh, seen as una socially unacceptable that, that you smoke, at least in, in, in a private place or sort of uh, not in open air. And uh, what I find it remarkable is this took place in spite of everything. Because if there is one powerful lobby, is the tobacco lobby. Uh, and they spare no resources to try to defend their positions and to make it impossible for this to happen. Eventually, it did happen. So I think it's a big inspiration for my fight. And, and I expect it will take at least 20 years. So I, I'm not here for the short term. So let's turn back to lobbying for a second. This is already a profession that's held in fairly low repute. Uh, can it be shamed out of existence? No, I think that uh, you know, it's, it's a bit like uh, 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 prostitution. If you have prostitutes because you have demand. And, uh, Prostitutes are always being held in shame, but uh, uh, what you need to do to re reduce, you can never eliminate prostitution. Uh, and it's not a coincidence I use this example because lobbying is the second oldest profession in the world. Uh, <laughs> is sort of a, in order to, uh, uh, to limit that, is you have to shame people who actually use prostitutes because prostitutes don't exist if there's no demand. Okay? So that is where you have to have your sort of shaming. And so you need to shame people who use lobbying to distort the fair competition. And this has not taken place. And, uh, and I think that uh, that's where we need to start. So one of the things I was surprised to see in your book, particularly from a, a libertarian coming from the uh, Booth School, is that not only do you favor class action lawsuits, but that you see advantages to the, the populist bias against high finance. Uh, w why is that? Again, I think that this is, goes back to I've seen a different world and I've seen how costly it is. So uh, my experience also on, on this board in Italy, et cetera, is 
how distorted is the legal profession in Italy? Uh, they basically are all corporate apologists. And they're not because they're bad people. It's because if you do sort of, if you're a corporate lawyer, the only way you can make money is by defending large corporations. And uh, so either sort of you go into a different profession, or in that profession, that's a way to survive. And as a result, not only they opine in that, in that direction, but also uh, the entire legal profession is shaped by this. So many of them are both professors and legal scholars, so they write their legal pieces. And of course, these legal pieces are influenced by the way they make a living. And sometimes it's not even an explicit bias, it's simply sort of a, it's life. You sort of, uh, you don't question who give you money and so, um, so how do you rebalance this is only if you have another interest that can compete. And I know that now in the United States sort of uh, cl class action suits have become sort of a, uh, a bad, uh, they have a bad reputation because of course there have been excesses and so on and so forth. And, and I think that uh, you can definitely reform them and make them better, et cetera. But there is something fundamentally right in class action suits, which is the following. In a country without class action suit, a claim of a million dollars is worth infinitely more than a million claims of a dollar each. So in an economic, from an economic point of view and from a freedom point of view, you want these two claims to be worth the same. But de facto, they are not because if you have a claim worth a million, you're going to find very good lawyers to defend it. If you have a million claims worth a dollar each, nobody will defend it. So this creates a fundamental bias that is not easy to address. And what class action, the, the legal genius behind class action is to say, we want to make it easier to aggregate the million claims so that they are worth in the eyes of lawyers as much as a million dollar claim. And in a sense, the beauty of this, this is the quintessential Adam Smith to find a way to motivate sort of a, or to exploit the motivation of personal profits for, for the greater good. So lawyers are probably below the pecking order, below economists, in how sort of greedy and bad they are, okay? So uh, we are bad, but I think lawyers are worse. So the, in general, they are not motivated by noble cause or anything like this. And individually, they sort of are, you might not like them, but they perform an extremely valuable sort of function, which is the one to rebalance the, the, the equation. And the same is true in the financial system. I, as, as a finance professor and as a sort of a libertarian, I am naturally biased against regulation. And I thought that uh, sort of a Glass-Steagall was not such a great idea. And I changed my mind, uh, not because Glass-Steagall is not inefficient from an economic point of view, but because I think it performs a important role actually for many reasons, but one of the reasons, most specific to this, is performs an important role in breaking down the power of the financial industry in lobby. So if you have different interests, they fight against each other. And in this fight, we benefit, like from the competition of two different companies, uh, from competition between Samsung and Apple, we benefit because we have these gadgets at lower prices. From the competition between different lobbies, we benefit because we have a more balanced government. If those lobbies are all together in one direction, then is them versus us and we lose. So breaking them down might be useful in that direction. Do you see those same kind of benefits from Dodd-Frank? Unfortunately, no. Um, in a sense, there are good parts of Dodd-Frank. I don't want to be sort of uh, uh, destroy everything. But uh, the part I, I'm most resentful of, Dr. Frank, is precisely on this issue of how to s separate sort of uh, risk. And uh, uh, I am 100% with the Volcker position. You don't gamble with insure money. 
Unfortunately, that position was used strategically to arrive to a compromise, which is the worst possible combination. So the way I interpret the compromise behind the Dodd-Frank is, on the one hand, there was a large popular support for something like the Volcker rule, uh, or a reintroduction of Glass-Steagall. On the other hand, there was the banking industry that really did not want that to happen. So Geithner compromise was, we have something called the Volcker rule. Sounds good because everybody trusts Paul Volcker. Uh, but de facto, this rule is so complicated that it is not implementable. And so the banks are happy. So the, the Volcker rule, for those of you who have not followed the details, and I have to assure you, is boring to follow the details. That, that's part of the process, actually. And I'm going to come back to, to this in a second. But the Volcker rule distinguishes between trades done by an institution for a client and trade done by an institution on his own account. And this seems like relatively easy, except that when they define what is a trade done for a client, it's not a trade that a client asks them to do. It's the trade done with the intention of satisfying the need of a client. So basically, if I trade an IBM stock, uh, I have to have an fMRI to tell whether in my intention I trade an IBM stock for a future client or because I want a profit in that moment. So any regulation that, is, that asks you to determine intent is not implementable. And what hurts me deeply is that everybody who sort of uh, walk in that area knows that. I don't think there is anybody involved in this who believes this is implementable. And that's precisely why they chose it, because it was not implementable. It sounded good, but it's not implementable. And that's one of the reasons why I came down to Glass-Steagall. Glass-Steagall is simple. Just to give you a sense, Glass-Steagall is 24 pages of legislation. Dodd-Frank is 2,400, of which sort of uh, the, the Volcker rule is 900. Okay? And this is only the basic law, and then there is sort of the subsequent regulation and blah, 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 et cetera. So uh, why things are so complicated? not because they have to be complicated, it's because they want to make them complicated. Because once they make it complicated, nobody follows. Uh, I am a finance professor. I'm interested in financial regulation. At the beginning of this process, I made a sort of a concerted effort of trying to follow it. And after a while, I have to say I had to give up. And I read some sort of short version and uh, summaries, etc. It was impossible. Unless you are a full-time paid lobbyist, you don't follow that. And that's exactly what they want. Because in this way, there is no popular control in what they do. It's com the regulation is completely captured. And so in front of this, then you have one extreme to which some of my colleagues subscribe, say, you want zero regulation. I don't believe in that extreme. Because I do believe that sort of a, a, a market is a fair playing field. And a fair playing field is only maintained with rules. Because without rules, you have a jungle. And the jungle is not a fair market. However, how do you make rules viable once you have this process? And the answer is, you have to have rules that are so simple. My favorite line is so simple that even congressmen can understand that. <laughs> And you know, you, you joke, but it's not a joke, because when Nancy Pelosi passed the uh, health care reform, she said, we need to pass it to find out what is in it. <laughs> it's so complicated that Congress people don't read them. And by the way, they don't have time to read them, because the average congressman does 400 fundraisers a year. It's more than one a day. How can you possibly actually read laws that are damn complicated if you, if you spend all your time fundraising. So unfortunately, we are in a system that is self-supporting and is spiraling down, and we don't realize that. And we need to break this. And there are a lot of ways to do it. One is sort of a, to do a, a reform of campaign financing, but also we need to have a reform of the way regulation is done. Because the way regulation is done today favors sort of a things that are so complicated so that you can put the loophole in the way you want. And I, as, I decided, and this is very costly for an economist, but I decided 
that I prefer a regulation that is economically a bit inefficient uh, if it is simple. And why? Because simplicity makes it more likely to be subject to popular control. And that's the only thing we have against complete capture. The reason why the democracy is a great system is not because it works particularly well, we know it doesn't, but because it's the only way to basically put a counterbalance to the power of vested interests. And what we need to do is try to leverage the small participation all of us are willing to provide, because none of us is a hero, none of us wants to dedicate all their life to fight sort of uh, uh, against the, uh, the windmill. But I think that uh, we need to have a system that leverage this small participation into an effective counterbalance to this power of vested interest. So let me take you back to the beginning of our conversation. Uh, we were talking about the Occupy movement and, and the Tea Party. Um, many of the recommendations that you make in your book and that we've been talking about are for long-term forms of change, reform of lobbying, changing business education, a uh, 20-year process of shaming. But what, what do we say now to people who are unemployed, who don't have uh, training for uh, jobs in the current economy, whose homes are underwater? We see vast stretches of that here in Chicago. What, what, what can you offer them? OK, I think that uh, uh, there are different parts. And some, uh, now I'm leaving my book, at least in part, but uh, I've written other stuff besides my book. And I have opinion besides my book. But um, I think that I will divide into two things. One is sort of uh, what happens to un people who have their home underwater. That I think that uh, on that I feel I'm very clean and very clear. Because in 2008, I made a very clear proposal on how you fix that problem. That problem could be fixed by regulation, could be fixed in a fair way, and was completely ignored. And I think the biggest sort of uh, um, indictment against sort of the Obama administration is that they completely ignore this problem. And I don't think it's Obama's fault. It's probably fault of Geithner and Summers, but that's a different story. But I think that that's, if you want to sort of uh, put in the negative column, that's the number one. Now, how could have been fixed? Uh, my proposal was very simple. If you are in areas that uh, experience a severe drop in house prices, let's say 30%. Uh, why don't we create an automatic renegotiation of the debt that will bring down your mortgages to the current value of the house in exchange for giving up 50% of future appreciation to your current lenders? So it was not a complete sort of uh, uh, giving up, it was uh, a partial. Uh, was done in an automatic way uh, and would have fixed uh, at zero cost for the taxpayers because this was a redistribution basically between lender and borrowers, uh, but it would have fixed a lot of problems in areas like Nevada, Florida, California, where this is a, a dramatic problem. Now, why was not considered? Uh, this, this is self-serving because I propose it, so I find a, a reason why it sort of failed, but it's because it was fair. And by being fair, did not have a big lobby. Because if I start saying, you need to give homeowners uh, a free pass and uh, 50 billion of US taxpayers' money, I will have a lot of homeowner association claiming, yes, we want this. Or if I said, we need to sort of uh, give 50 billion to banks in order for them to forgive, I will have a lot of lobbyists doing that. I basically said, let's do. Uh, something that the United States used to do very regularly at every crisis, we think the bankruptcy code. Uh, you know, the, the oldest debt contract in, in the history of humanity was the one that uh, the Babylonian king Amurabi wrote in, uh, I think, what, 3000 um, before Christ. And even in that contract, there was a fact that during the famine, you had to renegotiate. There was an automatic form of resetting uh, of that contract. And I think that during a major financial crisis or during a major downturn, not a normal one, but a major like the one we experienced, we need to sort of rethink uh, and find a way to speed up the renegotiation process. And that was my proposal and was ignored. So on that, I think there was a way and, and, and uh, 
today, I think it's less necessary than, than four years ago because a lot of people walk uh, their way through that with a lot of pain to themselves and to the economy. But on, on sort of people unemployed on other margin, I have less good news. I, I don't think I have the magic wand for everything. And as I describe in my book, I think that what made America so prosperous in the past is a unique position that they had coming out of World War II. If you think about back then the war, the United States ended World War II not only as the victorious power, but also as a nation with a phenomenal efficiency in its production. So at the, at the frontier of efficiency in production of goods and services, and with the best labor force of the world. At, at a time where most people were still illiterate throughout the world, here there was 35% of the population already with a high school degree. And so the US worker was something unique because you wanted to produce, you, you have fish, you wanted to produce, you couldn't trust to produce in other countries in the world. First of all, because we're afraid that we'd be taken over by the communists, but also because you didn't have educated workforce. So that made the US high school degree guy a scarce resources in the world. And if there is one thing we learn in economics, if you are a scarce resource, you earn a rent. That rent is what allowed the middle class in America to prosper, to send their kids to college, to buy a house and a bigger house, and to have this view that uh, the next generation will always be better than, than the, the previous one. That world has changed. And not because we in the United States have done something dramatically wrong, it's because the rest of the world has learned. It says, after all, the United States did succeed in nation building, not by sending armies in other countries, but by leading through example. And in a lot of the rest of the world, people have learned that you want to uh, have mandatory high school education so that people be become better, that you have to have the rule of law, you have to have the right incentives, and, and sort of now uh, India and even China are decent places to do business where people are, are, have an educated workforce, etc. This create, created an enormous competitive pressure on our high school graduates. And today, they are facing a tough life. And so we need to, do, to think about what we can do to fix that problem, but with the understanding that there is no magic, magic solution. And the solution to say, let's uh, construct, build a lot of houses so that they are employed for a while, in a sense, might be the wrong solution. Because yes, you give them a temporary employment, but you push more people to leave school to become sort of uh, masons or carpenter, and you create a bigger problem down the road. The huge housing bubble in the first decade of the 2000s has really contributed to not only obscure the problem that we have for a decade, but to make it worse. So what we need to do is hard work. Is we need to re-educate these people, create the incentive for these people not to drop out and go to school, uh, provide opportunities so that their schools are decent and they learn something and not just get a degree and so on and so forth. That is hard work that nobody, in, at least nobody I've seen in this electoral campaign, is willing to talk about. Okay, thank you. So uh, now my uh, turn asking the questions has come to an end and now it's your turn. Uh, if, if folks have questions, if they would please uh, come to one of the microphones here so everyone in the auditorium can, can hear you uh, and we'll uh, take a few minutes to do this. Just one? Oh, okay. yeah. uh, first of all, I'm a graduate of the University of Chicago Business School, and I was always disappointed. There was nothing about being making fair rules. It was only about maximizing profits, and the cleverer and greedier you were, the more you were respected. And when I mentioned this to the faculty, they could care less. They only wanted to do their research. My question to you is, let's look at Bain Capital. Now, a leveraged buyout uh, company or business, is this adding to the efficiency of the economy? And are they ha is there anything about a fair rules when you take a corporation and you eliminate uh, employees, how do you balance this out? Because I do think there's some ethical question. 
uh, certainly, there, there are a lot of, that's, that's an excellent question. There are a lot of uh, ethical questions uh, involved in that. So, but let's start with a, with a sad fact. The, the fact that I was describing earlier, the fact that uh, as a result of competition from the rest of the world, some jobs in the United States are not, or some uh, firms are not efficient and they need to be restructured. That's unfortunately a fact of life. And this change is extremely painful to everybody. Uh, they, is, it, is it painful to uh, the workers, but it's also painful for the managers who want to keep doing what they normally do it, do, and changing the way you think or change the way you run your company is not easy. And so leverage buyouts have been quite useful in forcing people to make this change. So uh, while firing people is not pleasant and is not uh, sort of uh, something that anybody, I think, want to do unless he's, he's a masochist, I think that, uh, or a sadist, uh, I think that is unfortunately something you have to do in some situation. Uh, so I think that I'm not against leverage buyout in general, but what you want to make sure is that, number one, uh, the debt you take on is not subsidized. So the most outrageous thing is that if you borrow, you can deduct your interest from your uh, corporate tax return. If you have equity, you can't. So here you have immediately a huge distortion in favor of taking more debt. Uh, that should be eliminated. Second, you want to make sure that uh, they pay the fair taxes in the process. So having some rules, uh, I don't want to go too technical, but the fact that uh, many of these private equity partnership, uh, they uh, give uh, the return to the partners in the form of capital gains rather than the form of labor income, even if it is labor income. That's a huge loophole. And as I said, I think it's only human that people try to exploit the loophole when they exist. What we need to make sure is that loopholes are closed. So I don't resent that people use loopholes. I do resent when they lobby to maintain those loopholes in face of any rational uh, uh, argument. And so I want to change those perverse incentives, not to necessarily prevent sort of a, uh, leverage by to take place. Uh, thank you all. I'm sorry we ran long and didn't have time for more questions. Uh, Professor Zingales will be signing uh, books upstairs afterwards. Uh, thank you all for coming.